Thank you for choosing Lawline to fulfill your CLE requirements, and welcome to this audio seminar. A verification code word will be played during the program. In order to receive credit for this course, you will need to enter the code word in lowercase online. We hope you enjoy this program, and thank you for choosing Lawline. Hello, my name is Ron Beanstalk. I am a partner at Scrincy Hollenbeck. I am the section chief for intellectual property and entertainment law there. And today we're going to have a uh, fun-filled primer on music publishing. Um, music publishing is the most Byzantine and arcane area of music, the music business. And we're going to do our best to make sure we've got all the concepts down. And we're going to start today with an overview. Um, what I'm just put in front of you is something that's taking me 35 years probably to put together, the music business on one page. Um, I call it the big picture. Uh, maybe that's a movie title, but I'm using it for this. Um, in the income streams in the music business, we have, I'm going from uh, right to left, uh, we start with live performance, and we next have merchandise income. In the middle, the most important one we'll be talking about today, music publishing. On our left are sound recordings, sometimes referred to as masters. So these four income streams in front of you represent the music business as we know it and have known it for some time. In 2019, uh, certainly technology, which I'll be discussing, has changed much of the music business. But the concepts of publishing and things related to publishing have really stayed the same. So now that you've memorized the chart in front of you, I will uh, move on. Uh, don't worry, we're coming back to it. Um, Let's talk about the music business in terms of publishing. Everything starts with a song. Unless, of course, you're doing improvisational music at all times or EDM without recording, everything to do with the music business starts with a song. And hopefully we have a hit song. Uh, defining a hit is a bit more difficult, but let's hope we have a song that has some type of audience attached to it. Whatever that is, there's success uh, with that song. And the underpinning of the song structure, the concept in terms of intellectual property, everything in the music uh, publishing world is based on copyright. So while we may be talking about trademarks with a band name, as we had in our little slide involving merchandise, everything today we'll be talking about is copyright driven. So the ownership of that copyright and how we acquire that ownership is crucial. So most important, we start with copyright. As I said in the beginning, music publishing concept remain essentially the same over time. But technology marches on, <clears throat> and those who would like to try to, uh, to not have it change uh, will lose out. Technology has changed since the very beginning of music publishing. You know, all you need to do is start with the concepts of print to mechanical piano player roles. No, I wasn't around when those were around. Thank you. Uh, uh, vinyl, tape. Uh, tape could, in the day could have been cassettes, even eight tracks. Many of you may not know, even know what that is. Now, CDs, and then we have the digital formats, and that's the whole technology lane, if you will. And that will continue to expand and continue to change. And we have to grow uh, with those technological changes and be aware of them and how they impact the essential concepts of music publishing. So let's just go through that again one more time. It's a copyright issue. The concepts remain the same. The technology changes, but, and it impacts the concepts, but essentially everything we're talking about today will stay the same, both domestically and also internationally. Um, the concepts of music publishing are not just here in the States, in terms around the world and how publishing works, concepts remain the same. All right, so moving on to organization. Organization is the key. Um, I have, in my practice in the last 35 plus years, have put into motion, I think is a pretty, pretty good approach to all these things, and that is to start with the concept of performance royalty organizations, which I'm going to get to in a second, as a good way to begin to organize what our clients are talking about. When a client walks in the door and says, I've written songs, how do I protect myself? I've written songs, how do I make money from that? I've written songs, somebody wants me to sign an agreement. I've written songs. Uh, and I don't know what to do, organization's the key. And the way we start with organization in the music publishing world is to start with the concept that if you write a song, you are a publisher. Now, I understand that clients are going to say to you, I need a publishing deal. So let's stop that here. That's a bit of mythology. All writers are publishers. All writers 
are publishers until there is a third party agreement that they execute. All writers are publishers. Starting with this concept, this is the most important thing we can start with. And just remember, historically, we've had lyrics and music being important factors. Some people are lyricists. Some people are uh, only composers of the music. But effectively, all writers are publishers, whether you're writing lyrics or music. So history started in the music business in terms of publishing, music publishing, with print. And we got to go way back to 1909. Again, I wasn't there. And even though all of you are saying probably was, not true. Um, 1909, we all go back to the point of where we literally had sheet music, and we printed sheet music. And the printing of the sheet music made you a publisher, but you wrote and had, you had a songwriter deal with your songwriter, hence the phrases publisher and songwriter. Conceptually, not wildly different, but technology, as we said before, changed all that. All of a sudden, there were new methodologies for creating sound carriers. So we didn't just have print. It wasn't just printed music. We developed all kinds of new technologies. So we still use the phrase publisher and songwriter. But that comes from the early 1900s, and we have marched on since then. On our next slide, I've narrowed the scope of our conversation in terms of our broad four income streams to just taking a look at music publishing. So if you look at our slide here, the copyright is on the right side, on the publisher side, and because the publisher controls the copyright. And if you notice how we started out writer and publisher, right? We've made a line in the page, we've made the writer side left side, we've made the publisher side right side, and we've begun to discuss the concept of how these are delineated and the income streams that come through music publishing will all be discussed in the next half hour or so or more and you'll see how they all line up. But this slide's important because it lays out graphically for you how the splits look and how you can understand them very simply as we go through them. So now that you've memorized that again, I will come back to it. All right, so let's get started with some detail. Performance royalty organizations, why do I use them to start with? All right, so let's, let's kind of lay this out. If you're going back to the Shanley case in 1917, if you recall what that was about, some of you may, the, that was when Victor Herbert had, there was an, an issue with Victor Herbert as a composer with a newly formed ASCAP, the first of the PROs, performance royalty organizations. Uh, there was a restaurant in New York that had the performance of his song being played on their piano player, and ASCAP, that had been recently formed, said, shouldn't we get paid from this? We want to create some rights that we get paid for. So from that Shanley case, the concept of performance royalty organizations collecting income for writers and publishers kind of began through ASCAP. How is the money collected? What do PROs do? All right, so let's go through that. Well, they collect performance royalties, performance of the composition, the composition, not the sound record, the composition. They collect income from the per public performance of the composition. So that's what they do. They start there. That's their function. They collect income from blanket license fees, still going on since that Shanley case. That's what that set up. Blanket license fees now have been collected over 102 years. And essentially, we'll say this. We start with, and here are my hand gestures. I know you'll see me wave my hands around a lot, but here are the hand gestures. So the most money is going to be the largest radio stations. They pay the most blanket license fees, right, into ASCAP, and there are two others, BMI and CSAC. Those are the three majors in the United States. And they will collect that income, put it into the big pot, if you will, and then according to your airplay, on and the number of plays pay you for that airplay. So they pay you domestically four times a year, quarterly, and they'll pay you twice a year internationally. That's why I have up, up domestically and internationally. Well, how does that collection work? Well, this is how the collection works. ASCAP will collect domestically in the US, and there are going to be their affiliates around the world. There's SOCAN in Canada, there's SESEM in France, there's GAMA in Germany, there's PRS in the UK, and, and JazzRack in Japan. And those international affiliates, they collect around the world and bring the money back to the domestic payer 
who pays you as a writer and a publisher. So the income is collected around the world and domestically and comes back to you. So how does that happen? Well, you've got to do a couple of things, and we're going to discuss this in a minute. You've got to index or register your songs. So the first part right there is, how are the songs split up between a writer and a publisher? Well, if you are, and I'm going to use uh, some uh, made-up names here, if your name is Sarah Angelica, you are the writer, and you'll need to affiliate if you're a writer as a publisher. Remember, no third-party deals have been uh, executed or negotiated, so you're controlling your own, as a writer, your own publishing. So songs are split between lyrics and music. If you write all the lyrics, and I'll use the two pie theory here, per permit me to give you the two pies, there's the lyrics and there's the music, they're both equal, they're both equal in the music business. That's my uh, shameless self-promotion for my firm, thank you. The uh, lyrics are equal, 50% and 50%. Uh, I want to take a moment of modern reference here. So I've put onto this something that is important because on a daily basis people discuss the concept of beats and what a beat is. A beat is music and we should refer to it as such because I think that we calling it a beat almost suggests it's something else rather than music. It is still a musical composition. So if a client of yours walks in and says I've written beats, well he's a composer. Right? He's a writer and a publisher of that music. He may then want to give, or she, or they, may want to give that music to someone else for them to put lyrics over. Some people refer, refer to it as rhymes, but it's lyrics. So we have lyrics and we have music. So beats are music. And conceptually, if we understand that, we've now taken a modern change and put it into the standard format of how music publishing works with no real differentiation. So clearly, beats are music, and we refer to them as such. We are making our uh, delineations and our technical details the same. Uh, they are no different. Uh, so let's move on to now the um, issues involving some co-writers and co-publishers we just discussed. If you have a co-writer and a co-publisher, we're going to need to talk about that right now. So on the next, here we go. How do PRO, PROs know what to collect? Well, clients are going to come to you and they're going to say, I've written a song, how come I'm not making any money? Well, first, they need to affiliate. They're a writer and a publisher, so they need to affiliate with one of the PROs. ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, take your pick domestically. I get a lot of questions and they say, which one's better? That's, there is no such thing. All three do their jobs very well. They're very good at what they do. There are differentiations perhaps amongst how they portray themselves, but that's a little bit of due diligence for your client. I think that they all do a fine job. I don't have a preference between them. Take your pick. Go to who you want. You don't get to pick your international affiliates because they're collecting through your domestic affiliate. So let's say we pick today ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. It is not important. They need to know what you've written. If you don't tell them, they don't know. Clients will say this all the time to you. I didn't make any money from my songs. And the first question is, did you index it? Did you register it? And they'll say, with almost, almost unhesitantly, uh, no, I have not. Okay. It's not done for you. It's online. It's simple. Um, it, it is going to be something which is not daunting. But they need to ex you need to explain to them, well, did you write all the music by yourself? Yes, I did, said Sarah Angelica. You're 100% writer. So we're clear, BMI is a good example, works a 100% writer, 100% publisher, equal pies. By the way, if this is being watched during a uh, meal time, I'm sorry for the pie references, you may take a break and get some snacks for the moment. Come back. Okay, we'll move on. So we have two pies, writer's pie, publisher's pie. Same size, equal portions. And let's be clear about that. When it comes to the music business and performance royalty income, it is the one time the writer's pie and the publisher's pie are equal. It is the first and only time it will happen. They are equal in the world of performance royalties. Uh, as a small quirky item, ASCAP may do 50% and 50%. I'm clearly telling you now it's the same size pie. They're just using some different 
uh, delineations, theory the same, full pi, full pi, don't be confused. And then we could always go to CSAC who does the 100%. So if we're clear about how it works with PROs, and it's very important to understand that, that we have equal pi's, 100% and 100%, the 50, the 50 is still the same. Once your client affiliates, and again, I'm going to suggest to you that any one of the PROs is fine. Once they affiliate as a writer and a publisher, in our case today we have Sarah Angelica, and uh, she has affiliated with one of the PROs uh, as Purple for Music. For those of you who know me, I tend to take um, pet names and ask people their street names, not the street name, their where they live street name, and say, okay. Uh, let's combine, you know, Fluffy with uh, Greenwood, and we have fluffy, fluffy Greenwood music. The easier name that your client comes up with, and you'll have to submit three names, three names to the PRO, to clear as a publisher. The easier the name is, the wackier, the zanier, the better, the faster it will clear. If people want to insist on saying things like great music, I, the best music, these have been taken. Remember, we're talking about things that are 100 years old, so a lot of these have been taken. The more offbeat, the easier it gets through. Tell your clients, please don't obsess about this. We all know how they obsess about their LLC and corporate names sometimes. This is not one time to obsess. It's not that important what we call it. What is important is that we affiliate as a writer and a publisher, and then we index. And when we index, we've told everybody around the world what the splits are. We have told everybody around the world, locked in now at the PRO, what percentage of writer we are and what percentage of publisher we are. So if we're the sole writer, 100%. If we're the sole publisher, 100%. Once we've done that, no changes need to be made. There'll be, there'll be circumstances, I'm quite sure, where people will say, I co-wrote, I forgot to do this. Those are gonna be a little separate. We could always work those out as we go, but for today's sake, Let's just say Sarah Angelica wrote, and let's say the song is I Love Lawline, and the song is I Love Lawline, and that song is 100%, she's 100% writer, and she is 100% publisher. All right, so there we go. So once we've done that, we have told the whole world how the splits will work. Now, now that we have our single, I Love Lawline, what happens with that single? Well, the single is indexed. We've told everybody what it is and ASCAP will then tell you on a quarterly basis, BMI, CSAC will tell you on a quarterly basis what your earnings are. So let's say $100 came in, it's $50 to the writer, $50 to the publisher. For today's conversation, that is Sarah Angelica, Purple Form Music. $50, $50. As I said, remember, in performance royalties, the one time only that they're equal is right now. So when we're talking about radio play, which is the simplest one for us to discuss, that $100, half and half. Easy. That one's pretty simple. Radio play is the easiest one we can talk about. Where we start to get into differentiations and a bit more complex is when we talk about synchronization licenses. So synchronization licenses, or a sync license, some people use an H, some people just use the C. A sync license is probably in 2019 and on one of the major um, income streams within publishing that people are pursuing. Why? Because there's still a valuable income stream here for writers and publishers. Uh, as we sell less recorded product, uh, this is still uh, an important level and, and on several different important uh, factors. One is uh, in the day, if you will, and today I'll be talking to starting with TV, the TV synchronization license, let's just start with TV. At one time, for those of you who might remember this, we had three major networks in the United States and we had independent channels. So synchronization rights, the right to synchronize your composition, which you control as the publisher, and we've named that Purple Form Music. Purple Form Music controls I Love Lawline, the song, they have the copyright. And they are the sole entity or person, if they're a DBA, who can make the agreement to have their composition, not the sound recording, their composition synchronized with moving pictures. Yep, 1915 technology. Yeah, synchronization has been around a long time because film was silent, we added music. 
and film without music these days would be rather dull. So same with television. If we had silent television, it'd be the same thing. So music, when it comes to um, TV rights and TV synchronization, where we start, this is a little bit easier than some others, starts with television from these three major networks. And now think about all the platform platforms that are out in the domestic uh, world. So you've got all of the cable channels, you've got sub rights on the cable channels to other shows they've got, you've got platforms from Hulu to Amazon to all these other places all looking for music. Either they have already budgeted for it or they will budget for it and they're looking for songs. And they're usually looking for songs that fit some type of uh, scene in a, in a television show. Um, in our case, I said I love Lawline. Well, I don't know. It could be uh, a jingle, for example. Uh, it could have been a uh, law-oriented television show. But ne the necessary issue is that they'll tell you as they seek out the publisher, right? If they're seeking the publisher out because they found the song and really like it, it's been a bit of a hit, they will find you. And how do they find you? Because when you've indexed and you've joined as a writer and a publisher, you've listed under the publisher at any of your PROs, your contact information. So knowing how to contact you is crucial, and I would suggest sometimes you may want to have contact information for you as the attorney, just in case your client's cell phone isn't on at the time, because these things work fairly quickly. Someone will want to contact them, and they'll want to tell them this is the scene in a television show we want to use. Um, maybe there's a um, law television show, we want to have this, and we want to use this in a scene that's perhaps a minute or a minute over, we want to use it on prime time network television. That's key. We'll discuss that in a second. So how do these sync deals work? Well, they approach the copyright holder, the publisher, and they say, I would like to license this song in this sync deal for this television show. The right to synchronize that is yours. So here's my offer. Uh, I'm going to show you perhaps in a one sheet or by sending over what the scene is all about. So you may uh, take a look at it and say, well, if there's something objectionable here, you may say no. It may pol be political, it may be tobacco or firearms or something that you may have an objection to, which is fairly common in a lot of th uh, these agreements. You may say, I'm not interested in having that, but almost everybody's going to say, sure, let's use my song. And let's say the offer's $1,500 as the sync. Now, the next question is moving back to what we discussed before on the income streams, is that who owns the master? The master is the sound recording, a separate copyright. Remember at all times, copyright in the composition, copyright in the sound recording. So we have to discuss the master use license now. Why? Because the song itself is embodied in that master. So the television production company who wants to use I Love Law Line says, hey, uh, do you control, as they would might call it, the master? Let's say Sarah Angelica recorded her own music. She owns it. You say, yes, uh, under uh, her label name. We can call that label name anything we want. We can say um, we used Purple 4 for our publishing, so we don't want to use that again for our record label. But we may say Countdown Music right, is the, uh, the necessarily the name of our company we use for owning the masters. And we say, sure, we can do that. So there's a corresponding sync deal for 1500 and a corresponding master use license for 1500 They may be 750 it may be 750 but whatever the monies are, they're generally equal. So once we've gotten that accomplished, we're now, we've closed our deal, we're into the television show, and they broadcast it. So how is income paid? Well, there was a fee, our sync fee, synchronization fee of 1500 If we controlled the master use license, there's another 1500 And then, here we go. Here's why we joined that PRO, when, to, when it gets onto television and is on prime time network, the most money, down to local, local cable access, we get paid from the performance of the song on television. Everybody's happy. Everybody's very good. Somebody's in the publishing business. Somebody just earned some income. Everybody's thrilled. This is why people pursue these sync deals. Syncs, or often, as I said, placements, are crucial to the success of any writer and publisher. 
And in the modern world of having these platforms, this could be actually the best and most lucrative area for people. Uh, it doesn't require you to tour. It doesn't require you to sell merchandise. It doesn't require you to be out there. It's you're at home as a composer, a writer, and a publisher receiving income from the synchronization of your song. Then you're earning performance royalties from the TV play of that song. That's music publishing. All right, so let's move on. Are film syncs different from television? Very, very common uh, question that's often asked. All right, so let's talk about film rather than TV. So TV may be a lower level amount. Film may be more. So I tend to say we'll add some zeros to a film sync. Uh, maybe we're 1,500 uh, for our sync for uh, I Love Lawline. And maybe now there's a law-oriented film. And of course, now we talk about budgets for films. Most film companies have around a 10% budget for, for music. Some are more if they're very music driven. As we know, a lot of films uh, use a lot of music that parents and grandparents can relate to, helps bring them into the theater. Um, the sync for film, maybe let's say $15,000 for I Love Law Line. So $15,000 for the sync for that. Next question, same question. Who owns the master? Okay. 15,000 if we own it, 15,000 for the master use license. And then when that film is shown on television, yep, additional performance royalties. And that's why we started with the PRO, because we've locked that into place. So whenever there's exploitation, and that's a good word in publishing, exploitation of that composition, we're already set up to, re to receive that. So, um, Film brings in a couple of other issues. There may be a soundtrack, not for today's conversation, of course, but if you own the sound recording, that's a separate agreement. Right now, we're just talking about the composition in the film. So film brings up a couple of interesting practice questions. Very often, it'll come to you this way. There'll be a moment when someone says to you, my client has an offer for their song uh, that they have put out independently and in 2019, almost everybody is independent. Um, and someone has an, a low budget film or an independent film, and independent films can run from $50,000, quite frankly, to $20 million. Um, they want to use this song. They want to use our song, I Love Law Line, in the film. OK. So the first question is, and often gets asked, what are they looking to pay for the sync license? And the word will be, well, they don't have a budget. All right. So as we all know, in law, we don't need to have substantial cons legal consideration. We can say $1 or $10, and we can make ourselves a spec deal. And I'm bringing this up because as a spec deal, what we're saying is we want to take a risk with you. We're going to give you a non-exclusive agreement. All right? The song remains ours. Of course, we control the copyright. And if we own the master, we're going to control the master. But we're going to allow you to put this under our sync deal into your film. And we're going to spec it. And by spec means that when you get a distribution deal domestically for X dollars, you're going to then pay us, under our agreement, additional income. And if you get an international distribution deal, and under our agreement that we're going to have under our sync license, you'll pay us additionally again. That's more of a film spec deal. So film can be a bit more lucrative. And of course, we may look for that opportunity because we may want to advance our client's career. So film sync and spec deals happen all the time. Uh, be patient with them because not everything is a no. There may be an opportunity for your client. So you look at spec, spec deals, uh, not with a uh, side eye, if you will. We look at them and just say, hey, potential good opportunity. Um, so TV, film, yes, very similar, very theoretically the same. There are some different opportunities when it comes to film in terms of some spec operation, perhaps, um, with diff different distribution. But once again, just to repeat, when that film goes to television, and it will, that is additional income from performance royalties. One side note, in Europe, uh, the in-theater play of film, um, sometimes our trailers and our in-theater play of film will earn us additional monies from our foreign affiliates that is not available in the U.S. domestically. Little note to have there, because when you get your uh, statement quarterly, uh, and then they'll add, of course, the international twice a year, you're going to see with your client how the earnings went, and there may be some of this income in there. Placement is a, the gift that keeps on, keeps on giving. And of course, when it's a television show, there'll be repeats. It'll make a little less as time goes on. 
When our film gets onto television, it'll get repeated and repeated. It'll make less as time goes on, but it will stay as an income stream for your client. So we're now advanced onto the concept of how syncs work, both film and TV. Well, this is leading to now to one of the biggest questions of the day, streaming income, and how does it impact the music publishing business? Um, uh, in all candor, streaming income does not replace the prior recorded product that preceded it. Um, and that is something which we have to know and understand, that streaming income is not necessarily always a publishing-oriented issue. They, under the uh, new legislation, uh, the Music Modernization Act, there'll be some additional mechanical income, which we're going to get to in a second, how, in terms of how income is paid from streaming. But streaming ultimately is really not replacing the sale of product. The chief income stream uh, from uh, streaming will be really ownership of masters and things of that nature, and that's really another discussion another time. But streaming doesn't replace the sale of recorded product. The chief income stream from recorded product, and I'm going to show you now where we all sit in terms of our overview of music publishing. We've gone through our performance royalties. We've gone through radio play. We've gone through TV and film. We've gone through synchronization licenses. And we're now we're going to talk about the chief income stream from recorded product, and that's the next one down, the least understood area of music publishing, and that is mechanical royalties. All right, I know you've memorized that slide. So, what are mechanical royalties? And of course, there's domestic and foreign. So, mechanical royalties, well, we're talking about 1909 technology. So, in 1909, when print music was still, as we discussed before, when print music, literally the printing of sheet music, was the king of uh, how things were done in music publishing, and our rock stars of the day were Scott Joplin, the concept of mechanical royalties did not come about until legislation occurred with the 1909 Copyright Act, which was really the second major copyright act that people refer to as the first. 1909 was the beginning of the concept of mechanical royalties. The publishers got together after losing another Supreme Court case and went to Congress and said, look, when that print music that I control, right, I control the copyright, when that print music is on some type of sound carrier and this newfangled thing is called a mechanical piano player role, when those sound carriers go out into the marketplace, I should get a royalty. Well, theoretically, Congress said, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I'm going to grant that to you. We'll go around this decision in 1908 at the Supreme Court case, and we're going to grant you um, a, a royalty, and we're going to call it a mechanical royalty based upon the technology of the time, mechanical piano player roles. So in 1909, we started the process of a sound carrier that embodies a composition must be paid to the person, right, when it's sold, must be paid to the person or entity that controls that copyright. That's why we desc described earlier on writer and publisher. Publisher controls the copyright, so the publisher will be receiving mechanical income from the sale of a sound carrier. And that started a long time ago. So, how are they collected? Well, a couple of issues. Uh, clients of, you, uh, of yours may say, I don't want the ABC band well, there was an ABC band, sorry, uh, the DFG band, uh, the DFG band re recording my song. And of course, under a compulsory license in our Copyright Act, once something's published, you can't prevent them from recording that. And why would you? Because we're about to collect mechanical income and potential performance royalties. Now you're seeing how the flow goes. So the first thing we say is how do they collect it? Well, that's a mechanical license. And your client, domestically in the US and Canada, can grant their own mechanical licenses. They're the publisher. They control it. This is the destiny they control. It's their copyright. So they can do this themselves. And I think that's misunderstood by most people, that actually they can do the mechanical license. It's a simple one-page agreement that says what they're going to get paid under the mechanical royalty concept. And of course, let's talk about mechanical royalties as they should be. They are delineated by statute in terms of the value because it's statutory, there's a statutory rate, 
and that statutory rate in 2019 is 9.1 cents. So it's pretty simple. If someone sells 100,000 sound carriers that have embodied your song, I Love Lawline, that's 9.1 per, well, cents per, that's $9,100. Everybody's very happy. The math just gets into a situation of just doing what's the next 10 times, right? You can go from <clears throat> 100,000, you can go to 1 million, whatever it is, you can see how it goes 9,100 to 91,000. And we begin to understand that mechanical royalties were the chief income stream in the music business in terms of publishing. And they were vast. That's a lot of money. Million selling product is $910,000. Call that a million dollars, if you will. And that's domestic mechanical income if it was an outside written song. Those of you who are probably familiar with recording agreements are saying, well, I don't get 100% under my recording agreement. Okay, sidebar moment, that is correct. That is called, the, the, in terms of most recording agreements, um, the concept there is going to be that you signed an agreement, and under that agreement, you're going to have a controlled composition, something you control. Under controlled composition clause, I, as the label will not pay you 100%, I only pay 100% to the outside publishers, I'm going to pay you 75%. Something you should know, deal with in great detail in another presentation. So let's talk about how they're collected. Well, we just discussed the fact that there's a license, your client can collect directly. There's an organization called Harry Fox. Harry Fox has been around for quite some time. They can collect mechanical income for you. But domestically, we're answering the questions above. The questions can be answered simply. You can collect them direct. And I think that's, again, misunderstood by most people. So yes, you can collect them directly. They're 9.1 cents. Let's talk about foreign, mechan foreign mechanicals and the collection. So foreign mechanicals are not based on US law, of course. They're based on the value of sale. And because they're based on the value of sale, they are more like 10 cents, if you will, per song. And so because they're 10 cents a bit, you know, a bit more than the U.S., um, there's great value there for our song that may have <clears throat> foreign success. <clears throat> so how are they collected? Well, we as Purple 4 Music cannot collect directly. We can collect our U.S. and Canadian as domestic. We cannot collect these foreign mechanicals directly. So we then have an administration agreement an admin deal, if you haven't heard of it, it's often refer just referred to as an admin deal, an admin deal to collect our foreign mechanicals. An admin deal, to be very clear, is not a publishing agreement. We have not taken our copyright and set this over to somebody either in an assignment or an agreement where our copyright is transferred to a third party. We are, if you will, leasing, licensing our copyright for the control of a third party to collect our income, generally the bulk of it, mechanical income, from areas we cannot collect directly. So if you're talking about an admin deal, admin deals are done by Cobalt and Universal and Sony ATV and Warner Chapel and many other companies. They will take generally a fee of 10% or 15% maybe if an advance has been given, an advance towards the collection. So we're clear it's not a copyright assignment. It's a term length agreement. Beware of any agreement that says you're setting over the copyright on some kind of permanent basis. That's not what an admin deal is. All right, An admin deal is a time term based agreement. Go collect my income for me seven, five, seven, ten years and it's going to come back to me. I will as publisher get that back and I can make another admin deal with you or I can make another admin deal with someone else. So administration deals are important for the collection of mechanical income and are not publishing deals. In going through the panoply of income streams involving music publishing, what are print rights? Well, we just went back a hundred and something years ago. Print rights were the only right at one time. It's all we had prior to all the technology involving either radio or the uh, various technologies we discussed that had sound carriers attached to them. So what's a print right? Well, print rights are controlled by the publisher. That means that whatever is going to be out in the marketplace as print of your lyrics and music, you control it. So you can make those rights with two major print music publishing companies in the United States, Hal Leonard or Alfred, for example. They put out songbooks. 
those songbooks are popular still. They still make money for various writers and publishers. They are generally going to have chord charts and melodies and the lyrics. Um, we also have online presence for these print rights. There's a thing called tablature, which is non-actual music notation, but looks uh, it's kind of odd, it's kind of numerical, um, but it's very popular amongst non-readers. These forms of print rights have value, they still have value. These songbooks have a thing called a personality folio attached. Sometimes it involves the personality, like a story of the artist with a picture or two. Uh, there may be additional percentages for that. Print rights are granted to any of the print music publishers, um, and th those are going to be either in formal hardcover books, songwriter books, songbooks, uh, best of books, online presence. They have value and they earn people money. Be aware that it's all controlled by the publisher. It's the publisher's decision to do that. So as we go through print rights, we have to describe what is the story here on print rights in 2019. Most people think that this is ancient technology and it has no value. As I said, very valuable. You can cull out of a, an agreement, and we'll be talking about the specific agreements, about how the various specific agreements in music publishing are done, but you can cull out of any of your uh, publishing agreements uh, print as a right that you can pull aside and make it separately for yourself. So know that when you're representing clients, that is available to you. It's often overlooked. How are print rights negotiated? Um, well, before we get to grant rights, how are print rights negotiated? Well, as I said, you control them. You have percentages of general deals, and maybe 10% to 15% plus this personality percentage that you will earn from the sale of each book. The net income, the deductions uh, are all negotiable. Uh, what is it based upon, again, is in the offer from the print uh, company. So they're negotiated pretty straightforward. They're not overly complex deals, uh, but they are important as an income stream that is, I said, often overlooked. Grand rights. Next one down the line. So grand rights. Grand rights are probably not discussed very often in music publishing, but they can be incredibly important. Grand rights are the rights that the copyright holder, our publisher, our copyright holder, holds to themselves, again, in that list we've been showing you. And the grand right says, as the copyright holder, if somebody wants to take my composition, I Love Lawline, and put this into a theatrical production, Broadway, and this is an old right for publishers, um, I have the right to say yes or no, and I negotiate those rights. So how they negotiated? Well, often misunderstood, they really negotiated in terms of percentage of box office receipts, number one. So the success of the production, the play, um, will generate the income depending on the success, the length of the run if something is on Broadway and then has um, road, if you will, versions of that production all over the U.S. or simultaneous uh, productions can earn someone a lot of money. Um, they're negotiated in terms of merchandise as well sometimes. You get a piece of whatever the income is from the play. Um, there are some splits. Uh, most plays that are musicals will have the book, so there's a book writer. They are not generally the same as the composer, so we may have some splits with our book writer. And then there may be the film version. Uh, Broadway has spun off many, many, many films, so we will have as a separate right, here we go, the sync right, the right to synchronize here our composition in the film production of what we already granted now is the grand right for the Broadway production. So we've gone through a list here of how music publishing goes down that list, how we then, let's see if we can get, there we go, and we can now show you an overview. So the following, once again, let's go through it. So we started out once again, writer publisher split. Right? And we discussed, and I just want to reiterate, we've discussed equal pies, writer, publisher, in performance royalties, the second line down, right? performance royalties. When it comes to radio play, very simple. We get radio play. This is terrestrial radio. If I hadn't said that, I need to say it now. Terrestrial radio. This is terrestrial radio. From our terrestrial radio play, domestically international, we get performance royalties, split equal. Right? Let's do that one more time. Split equal, two different two separate equal pies. When we go to TV and film, 
We're going back down the right side on publishing and the rights that go to the publisher. We go to synchronization licenses. Now we must have a separate agreement for the right for the copyright holder to allow that composition to be embodied in some type of uh, moving picture. So right now we're talking about television. Next is film, same thing, synchronization license for film. When we have sound carriers that are sold in the marketplace, there's a mechanical royalty. We said, let's say we'll go back to our, our uh, writer, Sarah Angelica, has an album out, and her album is looked upon by other people as being something containing songs they like. They want to, quote, cover those songs. As we discussed, a cover, they must pay a mechanical royalty under compulsory license. We have to let them record it. But they must pay the mechanical license to the copyright holder, right column. So we make our mechanical license agreement with the band that's going to cover our song, I Love Lawline, and us as outside publishers here, the copyright holder, uh, Purple 4 Music, as we use by the way of example today, will be collecting the mechanical come directly from that band. And they'll pay 9.1 cents for the sale of each sound carrier. So let's be clear about our technology. If it's a download, it's 9.1 cents. If it's a vinyl, it's 9.1 cents. If it's a cassette tape, hard to find these days, but made a comeback in Europe last year, they will be 9.1 cents. Anything with a sound carrier will be 9.1 cents. We excluded streaming before, just to be clear about that. Sorry, don't be clear. So we're talking about the payment of 9.1 cents to the publisher for domestic sale. That's collected directly by our client, potentially, in Canada and the US. We need an admin deal, next line down, for foreign collection of income. Streaming, we've discussed, doesn't always earn us as a uh, publishing piece of income, but it's on our list because there are some aspects to it. We discussed print print, which I still think has great value, and grand rights, which is the last and perhaps the oldest uh, right up here, uh, along with print, that is all in the column of the publisher. So we stop at the slide to say, this is a crucial moment. When somebody walks into your office, inevitably they're going to say, I may have signed an agreement. I need to understand what I've signed. And that is a comment we all hear all the time as practitioners. I've signed something. Did I do something wrong? I'm sorry, but I generally say, uh, that's like asking me if something looks infected. Uh, look at that. Uh, that. That can't be good. It's never good. It's hard to go backwards. But at least you'll understand what rights have been assigned under music publishing by your client by that chart above. And all those terms now will be very clear in that agreement. And you're going to know what just happened. And what just happened may not be the best thing for your client. Undoing it can be difficult. But we need to then talk about what the deals are. So let's take that moment. Let's say your client never set up a publishing company. Very common. They walk in the door. Maybe they understood what a PRO did, performance royalty organization did. And maybe they just affiliated as a writer. Well, that's not the best thing. But necessarily right there, we're going to say, OK, if you never affiliated as a publisher, someone comes to you and says, I'll be your publisher. And on the same slide, I've got advances, recoupable, reversion, all these technical issues we're going to get to. But the first part is to say, I'm the publisher. I like what Sarah Angelica has done. I like her catalog. I'm going to offer it an agreement to her. She's never affiliated as a publisher. She should have. She didn't. But that's a publishing agreement. There's no other entity, there's no other name, there's nothing else involved. But it's crucial to understand that if a third party publisher comes in, right, uh, clock time music, uh, if they are the next publisher and that agreement ends, that catalog has no name to it. Which is why I insist that everybody affiliate as a writer and a publisher with the PRO, which leads us to co-publishing. Co-publishing says, I have an agreement with Clock Time Music, and Clock Time Music and Purple Four are the co-publishers. 
Now that makes sense because when Clock Time Music and my agreement ends involving their control of Purple 4, and we hope it does end because we're going to discuss that as a reversion. Remember, this is a copyright deal. When that agreement ends, I go back to having Purple 4 Music and I can take Purple 4 Music and admin myself, <coughs> excuse me, or I can make a deal with another publisher, a co-pub deal. Next down the line, co-publishing, co-administration. Many times songwriters get together and there's a concept of something called a split sheet. A split sheet says what percentages of the song have been written by whom. We like to generally say two people in the room, 50-50. Right? Lyrics half, music half, if that's how it is. Perhaps you're a producer, you write the music, your artist, if you will, has written all the lyrics, 50-50. We try to make sure that maintains, that makes the most sense. Lyrics half, music half, that makes a lot of sense. Co-admin, co-pub may be an answer when there are two people who either maybe don't get along, people in a band who have co-writes that are splitting up, um, and anything that requires the administration of the copyright to be done separately from the other. Co-pub, co-admin. You take your publishing company, you move on, you administer your own share, you collect your own income. You move on, take your publisher's share, take your administration rights, you collect your own income. We split. The issue here is, how do we agree on a sync license? So as a practice tip, if you're going to be involved in a co-pub, co-admin deal, make sure that there's some agreement of how a sync license is effectuated. All right. That could be that we agree that certain things are never approved, and here's a list of approvals. And we always come together so we can both earn income as co-publishers, co-administrators. We discussed administration rights. Administration right is not a publishing deal. It's up under that heading, but it's not a publishing deal. It is not taking the copyright and assigning it to anyone else. It's a term length deal. What are advances? Advances of the money given to you by publishers who are going to give you an advance towards the income under your publisher share because as we now know that's where all the income is coming this has nothing to do with the writer's share remember that just the publisher share they're going to give you an advance let's say the advance is fifty thousand dollars for your catalog all of that will be recoupable our favorite word in the music business recoupable. All monies under the publisher's share, unless you have a separate agreement as to any flow through, all publishing income will be held back, recouped back, until the advance is fully in, fully recouped, and then we'll give you your share. So what is a publishing deal? A publishing deal splits the publisher share generally, 50-50. There's a misnomer here that many contracts call them a 75-25 as if your writer's share was 50%. It is not actually. We know writer's share is just the performance royalties. We now know that. We're all experts on that. The recoupable nature goes against the publisher's share. So the song comes out. It's through a third-party publisher. The writer will always receive their writer's share if they've indexed it. And then the publisher have, has given you an advance. They're going to recoup their monies from the income streams and then as it comes back, they get back their 50000 They're going to pay you half of the publisher share income from here on in. That's a publishing deal. What is a reversion? A reversion is that the copyright is coming back of the catalog. That copyright is returning back to the publisher, the original publisher. In our case, Sarah Angelica's publishing company, Purple 4. How does a reversion work? must be negotiated. You're going to notice if you're practicing in the area that publishing deals are generally driven by people for all, sometimes all the wrong reasons. An advance, I need the money, I want the money, I need the money. Granted, hold on, an important moment. Am I getting these songs back? Or am I granting an assignment for all my catalog? I might have all my hits in this catalog to a third party publisher and it's never coming back. An important factor. What happens when that third party company makes a deal to sell all that catalog to somebody else? And then somebody else. If you will, 
flipping houses, flipping copyrights. Well, as the co-publisher, I then have to be very uh, dutiful and do my due diligence to make sure I'm earning my income from these companies down the line. That's why a reversion over 10 years post-recoupment, 15 years post-recoupment is crucial. The rights will return back to the original publishing company. Crucial moment. It's very important to understand why reversions are important to discuss. I have it here because while we're talking about primers and publishing, many times the agreements you're going to look at don't have a reversion. And your client is saying to you, well, I own this. And you're going to say, I'm sorry, you don't. You signed an agreement giving all the rights, all the panoply of rights under the publishing column to a third party, no reversion. So be very careful when we're going through this as to knowing now that the parts of the agreements are coming together and the income streams are coming together, that a reversion is a very crucial, very important discussion. The audio verification code for this course is outside. O-U-T-S-I-D-E, outside. The audio verification code for this course is outside. O-U-T-S-I-D-E, outside. Well, we've returned to that slide you memorized in the beginning, and here we are. So now you get the big picture again. All right. We can see that publishing, the center of our income streams in the music business, publishing, right? We see where the copyright is on the publisher's side. We see how it relates to everything else. So let's just make the movement here. So we write a hit song, and Sarah Angelica has a hit song, I Love Lawline, and when she's out in the marketplace selling this song, because people now love that song, they want to have her perform live. Let's move over to the first column. So she's now earning income from live performance. A hit will certainly beget live performance. Then live performance, when you're playing live, will earn you money from merchandise. Then hopefully we're selling masters and sound recordings in the last column. That's how the music business works. That's how publishing fits in. Because the hit drives everything else. The one column I want to point out on the top left, you'll see Sound Exchange. Sound Exchange is a different type of royalty structure that has very little to do with publishing. It has nothing to do with publishing. I should say that's masters. But you may see the word in your practice that somebody will say, performing royalties under Sound Exchange, a separate income stream. That's for masters. That's for sound recordings. That's why the slide's important. That is not a publishing-based income stream. That's for sound recordings. Very important. All right. Now, that once again, we've realized that. I come to my favorite part. My favorite part of the discussion of publishing is right here. Because inevitably, when people start talking about the second they were in your door as a client, they're going to say, someone's going to steal my music. And I pause for a second because I'm sure you've all heard this. This is their overriding issue. This is their overriding concern. And it shouldn't be. The most important thing should be, as we've gone through today, the organization of their publishing as a writer and a publisher is the most important thing. Start there. Start with putting things organized so they have to affiliate with a PRO as a writer and a publisher. The copyright issue, the copyright registration issue, the protection issue, I wait to the last moment always to discuss that because it's not the most important issue. Music publishing is the most important issue. The organization of music publishing is the most important issue. We can't make agreements. We can't earn income unless we have organized according to what we've just discussed. If the first issue is just to discuss how to protect them, then we're off to the wrong side because we need to explain the writer's share and the publisher's share or co-writes. They may not be the sole writer on the sole issue. So rights are shared amongst other people. There may be third-party writers and publishers, and there may be more than one. Uh, I can just let you know from uh, practical everyday experience when it comes to hip-hop and R&B, we may have 10 writers on one song with small, small issues involved. There may be samples. We may have other issues involved. These are all music publishing issues, and that's why you need to organize everything. 
but talking about writers and concerned about people stealing their music. I don't want to be cynical about it. I usually say, why you? Because um, generally a song would be a hit that somebody wants to, uh, if you will, take uh, some piece of. But more importantly, writers have all the wrong concepts if they're brand new. Things like sending uh, recorded material to themselves in the mail. All right? We all know uh, as practitioners using the Latin word hui, that's nonsense. All right? It's nonsense. That doesn't mean anything. I know there are you, those of you right now arguing with me. Uh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, but argue me right now that are saying, sure, it has value. No, it has no value whatsoever. The most important thing is going to be if the song is in fixed form, it is copywritten. If the song is in fixed form and we register the copyright, we have completed what we need to complete. It's gone to the copyright office. We have our stamp. We have our prima facie case of us as controlling the copyright. That's how music publishing will work, simply in terms of the, quote, protection. So when someone says, how do I secure their rights? Well, the securing of the rights is literally just that. It's in fixed form. We have sent it in for registration. We have that back. It's been stamped, and it's ours. That's how music publishing works. So in closing, in summary, organization's the key, affiliating with the PRO, understanding that the publisher controls the copyright, understanding that the writer share is in performance royalties only, the panoply of income streams that flow through to the publisher are crucial, that the most important thing at the very end will be our uh, registration of a copyright, but the most important thing will be the organization factor. So let me just sort of stay at this point. Uh, I really appreciate you letting me uh, prattle on here for an hour. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, if you have any more, I can get them through Lawline. Uh, I want to re uh, really thank everybody here at Lawline who always does a fabulous job uh, in making sure this production is as good as it can be because certainly uh, I need their help. Um, so once again, thank you so much and we'll see you at the next uh, uh, presentation. Thank you.